Um, so we are, we, we are um, a small group of Envoy developers within Ericsson who customize Envoy filters for our custom use cases for 5G telecom applications. Um, uh, I did this project along with my colleague Sven Steinacker at Ericsson and also Yi Zhu from Intel who contributed for the hardware acceleration part of this um, talk. Uh, so for today's agenda, we are going to look at some of the background regarding uh, the, uh, the problem statement, why we had to go for something like a tapping filter, and uh, some overview of the existing tapping sinks that we had in Envoy, why we had to go for this new gRPC tapping sink, and some um, robustness machinery that we added for um, our tracing mechanism. And then finally, uh, we would uh, discuss a bit about the hardware acceleration part that we needed for memory copies for this uh, tracing machinery. Um, so just to give you a brief background of uh, what we work on and um, uh, where this use case exactly fits in. So uh, the uh, la latest 5G core uh, network uh, looks something like this, where there are a lot of distributed network function, each having its own life cycle and independent policies and management interfaces. Uh, basically, they all communicate to each other via HTTP2 on a service bus, uh, on a service bus. and uh, me and my colleagues basically work on two of these uh, network functions that you see, which are called service communication proxy and a security edge protection proxy. Basically, these two proxies sit between the whole traffic that goes through a 5G core network and essentially act as the window into what is the traffic within the 5G core domain. So uh, naturally, in a multi-vendor ecosystem like telecommunications, you can expect that um, there are multiple of these network functions, each coming from different vendors. And the uh, diagram that I show over here is basically one of the first problems that we faced, wherein um, one of the uh, network functions uh, coming from one of the vendors was not functioning properly on the ingress side. So how do we isolate that fault? How do we um, troubleshoot that? So that was the basic question. And so there are some means that um, uh, a distributed um, uh, deployment system like uh, Envoy with Kubernetes uh, provides you, such as uh, metrics, and logs. However, uh, however, metrics can only show limited information about certain failure situations, such as labels, which cannot be fully comprehensive, and hence they cannot give proper header qu uh, query or body parameters regarding the failure. And then raising the log levels is also not an option for uh, capacity sensitive um, uh, use cases. Then the main two uh, alternatives that we went across was um, TCP dump and EVPF. TCP dump basically uh, would sniff on the packets on the ease interface. And basically, if you have um, encrypted traffic, you wouldn't be getting any useful information out of TCP dump. Uh, EVPF, on the other hand, is uh, more interesting because it can um, attract the TCP level info coming from kernel itself. However, the problem again is uh, elevated privileges that you have to give to the uh, eBPF program to tap the traffic. And um, also TLS would again um, give you a problem that you cannot make any uh, meaningful uh, assessment about what is the traffic that goes through your system. So Envoy uh, is a useful candidate for uh, extracting complete request information and providing it in real time for post-processing or troubleshooting. So how would such a architecture basically look like? So the easiest way to visualize it is that we have uh, an envoy some, uh, sitting in the ingress traffic path and we basically provide some form of representation of the current traffic that Envoy is proxying onto an external processing unit. 
And that external processing unit can then further do some post processing and give that as a general representation like TCP DOM, like, uh, sorry, PCAP or PCAP NG, and which can be used for customers for their analytics or their troubleshooting guidelines. Uh, so one can go with the easiest approach for this, which is to just log whatever traffic that you have. Unfortunately, you know the uh, pitfall with this, namely that you create too many logs and then you just end up uh, killing capacity for the Envoy container. Um, eventually, we decided to try out the tapping filter with an Envoy. Just another side note to mention to this would be Distributed tracing is not exactly the same as a uh, tapping filter, uh, mainly because distributed tracing works by tracing the traffic flow by attaching metadata or headers, which is not exactly the way uh, tapping works. Tapping just gives you whatever is the raw socket binary information, and hence it is protocol agnostic as well. Although we say here it is for HTTP2, you can easily extend it for other uh, layer 7 protocols as well. And we will look at how Envoy provides some machinery for that. So Envoy provides quite some options for configuring this tapping filter. So basically, it uh, offers two main uh, machinery, you could say, which is a, a tapping level and a tapping sync. So the tapping level can be done at TCP or at an HTTP level. At an HTTP level, you would introduce um, additional overhead because you are tapping at each individual HTTP2 request or response frame. And that introduces um, an unnecessary overhead that could easily be overridden if you just make a simple choice of a TCP level tapping wherein uh, you would be tapping the uh, request and response traffic flow basically on the TCP, um, uh, basically on each TCP event. So that is on a connection in it or on a connection read or write or on a connection close. And you can tap that information and use it for, for the post processing. And the other part is the tapping sync. The tapping sync is the entity which allows you to um, stream uh, your traffic representations to. And we will first uh, have a brief look with the tapping levels and the filter chains that Envoy provides to see how we can be creative with um, uh, TCP traffic tapping. So uh, the filter chain within an Envoy is basically layered and also um, customizable. You can reorganize them mostly very flexibly. And therefore, even if you have TLS, you can still have clear text representation of your traffic, which has been the major problem that TCP dump couldn't solve simply by sniffing on the each zero of the pod. So what we do is basically have um, a proper layering of our filter chains such that the TLS traffic is um, uh, first decrypted on the ingress path, then we buffer it, and then we um, submit it to the tapping filter. And then we have our own custom HTTP2 filter chains, which does the post-processing on the filters. And then on the egress path, we have the same um, request path that we had for ingress, basically in reverse, wherein first you would tap, and then you would buffer it and submit it for the uh, encrypted traffic path out of Envoy and to your target pod. Now, here as well, you may have um, more uh, granular uh, constraints such that on the ingress side, you only tap from certain sources with a specific IP or an egress that you only uh, trace traffic towards a, a specific IP or towards a specific host. Um, so how do we deal with this issue? And this is also a, a good uh, means of constraining this filter in case uh, you have too many workloads and you just don't need to tap everywhere. Rather, you want to tap selectively at um, your pain points within the cluster. And so the way you can do it is with um, 
the extension within the tapping filter, which provides you to assign uh, tapping only to a given source IP address. Uh, keep in mind that this source IP address is subject to what is the external traffic policy that you have. So it would be IP, IP address 1. If it is local, if it is cluster, it would be IP address 2. And so it is sensitive with that. And on the egress side, we use uh, something called as a transport socket filter to ensure that we segregate uh, the tapping only onto those uh, endpoints which we need which we need to tap. So in this example, we only need to uh, trace the traffic that are going from Envoy to these endpoints H1 and H3. And I don't need to trace the traffic from H2 and reduce the overhead that is associated with it. So I basically don't assign a transport socket or a tapping associated with H2 using a endpoint metadata and a transport socket matching filter. So here you can see the blue boxes basically have a tapping metadata set to true. Uh, which would be selectively used by endpoint H1s and H3 because uh, they have the tapping metadata also set to true. Meanwhile, the endpoint H2 wouldn't pick up um, the tapping filter, so you wouldn't get any traffic uh, tracing out of uh, the H2 endpoint. And then comes the question of um, which of the tapping things to use. Um, so as I s uh, said previously, Envoy offers three basic tapping syncs, a uh, file-based one, admin, and a custom one called gRPC that we introduced. The file-based tapping sync is um, mostly unacceptable for critical use cases with security or privacy concerns because basically Envoy writes uh, the whole request body or headers onto a file itself. The admin-based one seemed very promising until uh, we had a closer look at its performance. And so in this diagram, you can see um, how basically the admin sync works. So Envoy basically has a siloed approach for a routing traffic. So that means that each worker thread has its own context of filters and filter chains and they provide the traces onto the main thread, which uh, is where the uh, tapping interface lives. And as a result of this, you can see in the bottom picture of top, um, uh, the main thread has um, almost 71% usage simply because we are collecting the uh, traffic traces out of it. Uh, this would be a big problem if you had XDS or other stats that are running critically on uh, on your network, mainly because XDS and DNS and stats collection all reside on the main thread. And if they ever get bottlenecked because of your tapping, you may not be able to change the configuration. So um, it impacts all sorts of use cases for uh, your service mesh, or if you're just having Envoy as your gateway, you cannot modify your configuration, which is a big problem. So we try to overcome it by uh, extending the tracing interfaces to accommodate a gRPC tapping sync. Uh, the main objective here was to prevent interference of the main thread as far as possible when we are streaming the th uh, traces. Uh, we took inspiration from an earlier discussion on uh, the GitHub for this issue, and we decided to implement a version of it ourselves. So this diagram basically represents how uh, traces are captured within each worker thread, and then they can be given to a traffic trace sync, which can post-process it into a PCAP NG or a PCAP frame. Um, the tapping subsystem uh, thus created has basically two parts. One which indicates uh, the connection information, which comes at the beginning of every TCP event as we are tapping things on TCP level. And the other one is the trace information, which would contain all the information about the headers and the body and query parameters, etc. 
uh, the connection information is only sent once, and that is a um, s slight bit of a uh, problem with uh, the tapping implementation, such that uh, only in the beginning of an HTTP2 connection does it send out this connection information. So your traffic uh, sync has to basically cache this and use that as a reference to uh, create your post processing of uh, to post process your trace information segments um, so you can imagine a very simple problem wherein your uh, trace sync just happens to restart because of some network disturbance or process issue that means all your previous um, information regarding the connections that you were holding so far is lost and as a means to overcome that particular problem, we decided to add a thread local cache within each uh, worker thread for this tapping. So uh, what it does is basically um, provides a reference-based indexing of all the connection information that the worker thread is currently processing, and it adds it into a cache. And whenever the um, uh, uh, whenever the tracing sync has a restart, it will detect this via uh, TCP lifetime and other handshake parameters, and it will replay the um, address information that was present in the cache uh, to the tracing sync all over. So uh, in a practical situation, you might have a few number of connections that are long-lived and as a result this cache is not too big it's just a um, few uh, few hundred connections which is not too intensive and you can replay all of those to your sync so that uh, any subsequent trace information uh, would have uh, the adequate uh, connection information to recreate the whole um, traffic frame, either in uh, traffic frame for, for the processing. Um, and, the, and some of the things by which we kind of uh, verified it for consistency uh, in the field is via counters. We just basically added counters onto our extension and also in, onto our sinks and basically verified um, whether the tap, tapping socket works as expected. This wasn't um, uh, already given within the current standard Envoy, so we had to make some extensions for that, and yeah, it ensures consistency. And um, going now with how we were, um, how was the experience with deployments in live traffic? Overall, we were quite happy with the tracing solution that we developed. Um, we had like uh, an overhead introduced of about 5% into our max request per second capacity for Envoy. And the end-to-end -end Envoy latency um, as a result of enabling this traffic tapping onto um, multiple listeners and clusters was in the order of um, 1 to 2 milliseconds, which are subject to load conditions and networking setup. Um, but still is a very low overhead compared to any other machinery that you might have. Uh, and it has been extremely stable in production networks with no elevation of uh, privileges for the containers required. And it um, works reliably since day one on several of the live 5G networks that we have running several hundred thousand to a few million requests per second. And um, with that, I would like to uh, move on to the bit regarding um, a memory copying and memory acceleration uh, that was done by my colleague Yi Zhu Zhu. Uh, so basically, tapping would have a lot of memory copies to mirror it uh, to the tapping sinks. And so uh, Intel came up with an approach for faster memory copies with hardware acceleration. And I would like to just play the presentation that um, Yishu prepared. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here due to a private issue. This is Yishu from Intel. 
We are glad to share this topic with Devon to you at Coupon23. Unfortunately, for some reason, I can't join you today in Chicago, so I'm going to share my part from video. Now let me continue our session on hardware acceleration. As you may know, for most cases, memory copy is not a problem for envoy. Request and response are limited to a few kilobytes in size and won't take much time in the overall process. But for some special scenarios and requirements, things are different. Like traffic mirror, a feature allows user shadowing traffic from one cluster to another. This is a very useful feature that allows feature teams to bring changes to production with as little risk as possible. Envoy will make a copy of live request data to mirror service. With the increase in request size, the data copied can be quite substantial. And another example is TLS memory linearized. This is an operation defining buffer system occurs before TLS encryption is applied. Linearize copy and recombine multiple small size buffer into a large one to reduce the frequency of encryption and associated overhead. For large size response, linearize also comes with a significant amount of copy, which can up to 10% of overall processing or test. As for traffic tapping, our topic today, Memory copy is also a crucial issue that cannot be ignored when it comes to a large request or response. Tapping filter would make a copy of all traffic to generate product buffer fail, then save it locally or send to remote service for later analysis. This scenario performs more intensive copy compared to previous scenarios. Based on our observation, the proportion of copy can up to 20% of entire process in some cases. So we believe it can be a scenario suitable for hardware acceleration. Now let's have a brief introduction of the hardware we're using for acceleration. DSA, short for Data Streaming Accelerator, is PCI device integrity in fourth generation Zion processors as one of the accelerator. It's already hit the market this year. DSA supports a series of memory copy operations like move, the memory copy, do cast, copy data from one address to another two addresses at once, and so on. One thing we should know about the factors that affect memory operation acceleration is the copy size is a key value. When the copy size exceeds a certain range, we can expect benefit from DSA. Otherwise, using CPU is a better idea. So that's also an issue we will take into consideration in our acceleration test. Then let's consider the issue of integration. DSA provides two kinds of library allow us to offload the, at two levels. DML, a library works at application level or using DTO, short for DSA transparent offload library at the library level. The advantage of using DML is that we can precisely control every single copy. But the drawback is you need very best knowledge on how acceleration can help. As we said before, in many cases, it is not a good idea to offload small size copy. And another downside is the modification to the code increase complexity and maintenance costs that may out of our control. So what we want to use is a transparent, non-intrusive approach. We we'll hope that library works at a low level determine if each copy operation is suitable for acceleration. If the copy size is above the threshold we set, offload it, otherwise give it back to CPU to do it. 
and that is exactly how detail works. The detail is preloaded with envoy by environment variable and intercept every memory copy function to glibc. All the copies are classified into two categories based on size, small ones to CPU, large ones to DSA. In the whole process, we don't have to mess with the code and recompile it. All the offloads are transparent to envoy. So that's the plan. Next, let's see how we perform our test and what we got from the acceleration. We design our test using TCP tapping with HTTP 1.1 protocol. 1000 clients connect concurrently. Fields requested by client, which is the body of the response from Envoy, ranging from 64 kilobytes to 1 megabytes in size. We also use direct response, which means the Envoy responds directly with the prepared field in the once, instead of communicating with upstream cluster. That will significantly increase the proportion of the memory copying overall process. We have two groups, one for CPU, another using DTO with DSA. The DTO threshold is set to 256 kilobytes, which means it will only offload for copy size above 256. And for the result, as shown in the diagram, CPU got an advantage initially, and the copy size increase they are running neck and neck at 256. Following that, DSA got a better latency than CPU, which align with our prediction and understanding on DSA that we got more performance benefit from bigger copy size. You might have questions about the performance difference below 256, since both are CPU-based operations why is such a difference observed? I think that may come from the interception overhead. Intercept and determine which way to use need to take some CPU resource. And finally, let's look at what would happen if hardware memory acceleration and what we can expect it. First, from a hardware perspective, DSA is back to a persistent feature in future generation of Zion products. So it may be faster or support more upload operations that we can introduce into Envoy for acceleration. And second, for Envoy, our software level, as a community is still exploring the potential of Envoy, many new scenarios and projects that can void gateway or something emerging. So it would be reason to expect there are more suitable cases like CDN or something for void to do acceleration. So that's all for my sharing. Thank you for your listening. Yeah, that's uh, what we wanted to present to you and um, um, regarding further comments about uh, the status, we haven't been able to upstream it so far to the Envoy, but we are planning to upstream the solution soon. And um, yeah, hopefully you would be interested in providing reviews, comments, and everything would be appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, 
when during the design process, like, did you at all have to take into consideration memory concerns? Like, if you had a really large request and whether that might, you know, cause large amounts of memory or like perhaps a slow connection to the gRPC server that could have caused those sorts of bottlenecks? Um, yes. Uh, so at the moment, the way it works is basically by moves. So there's no implicit copies within it. Um, so I think we are, we have tried to be as optimized as possible. Uh, but yes, we do have some upper thresholds on um, what traffic we can trace. And uh, I think we cap it at like something like 64K, something like that. Uh, but, um, and so that is the part where the hardware acceleration really comes into play, I think, which would enable like faster copies or faster moves if they are required. And, um, yeah. Okay. So, so are you basically saying that you truncated the messages at 64K? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. And I, I was also in your, uh, EnvoyCon talk, uh, I, I I think you mentioned during that talk that uh, possibly mentioned PCAP support. Uh, is that something that you implemented as well? Um, yes. It's So the solution that we came up with was quite broad. And um, what we intend to present it and upstream is just the NY extension. Yeah, so, um, um, yeah I, I was just interested to know more about sort of the infrastructure for the PCAP playback, if, if that's something that you're, you're able to talk about. but. Um, happy to take that offline somewhere. Um, no, I th don't think I'm allowed to. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks.